Welcome to the Peaceful Political Revolution in America podcast. Bernie loves to point his finger at the elites, but who are they and where do they come from? It seems as if Bernie believes they possess a lot more influence than the rest of us. But what does our preamble mean if not that we, the ordinary people in America, are the ultimate source of power and law in America? So then, who were the elites? How did they differ from the mass of Americans in 1776 and later in 1787, even today? What about revolutionaries like Thomas Paine? Was he not an elite also? What role did he play in creating our government and just who were the founders anyway? Most Americans were revolutionaries in 1776. They were the self-proclaimed sovereigns over their new and independent nation, and it was only they who could grant the consent of the governed, or when necessary, exercise their power and duty to establish a constitution of government that would serve their needs and protect their interests. The concept of popular sovereignty is something of a dinosaur for most Americans today. America is the world's superpower, so how could everyday average Americans actually control their government, or if necessary, create a new government that would faithfully express the will of most Americans? I know I am still trying to figure out what it really means to be an American, why it is that we think of ourselves as so exceptional. Is it our Constitution? If it is, what is it about our Constitution that we so revere and how does that make us so special? Robert Ovitz is a lecturer in political science and public administration and he writes about the politics of the labor movement and the crisis of capitalism at the turn of the 20th century. He has a PhD from the University of Texas, Austin. Among other publications and advocacy work, Robert is the author of When Workers Shot Back, 2019, Workers' Inquiry and Global Class Struggle, 2021, and most recently, We the Elites, Why the U.S. Constitution Serves the Few. Robert, welcome to the Peaceful Political Revolution in America podcast. So how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, John. You're very much you're welcome. In season one, I talked with Jerry Frescia on his book, Toward an American Revolution. You probably are aware of that. Yeah. And he had quite a lot to reveal about the framers. Your book, I would say, digs maybe even a little deeper. It's a richly textured mosaic of, of the framers and what they were all about. You describe the framers as elites. I guess my first question is, do you think that our political system today continues to enable the same class of people as it did back in 1787. Well, I think the reason that I wrote the book, I have several reasons, but one of the main reasons is exactly that, that for too long, and I don't, I don't, I'm feeling a little shy about admitting my age, but I've been around for half a century. And for my entire political life, which goes back to when I was in high school, I have seen nothing but disappointment and frustration with the way that our system works. And I teach perhaps 500 students in intro to U.S. and California federal and state government. And I see a large, large number of young people who are completely turned off or disenchanted with our system. And one of the things that I'm trying to do is try to encourage them to understand the source of that frustration and alienation and disappointment, and that it's not them. We are constantly told that our system doesn't work because people are apathetic, because they don't turn out to vote, because of big money, what's called quote unquote dark money from corporations and the super wealthy who are trying to buy elections or rigging the, the media around politics, like with the buyout of Twitter yeah, by the world's richest man. Yeah. And I, I try to encourage them to understand that the system we have is designed to frustrate us. And so I think that this question of what is the role of 
economic wealth and power in our system is not a marginal issue, like some really excellent books, but that's the framework that they approach it. And that's the way it's approached in my discipline of political science. Politics is here and the economy is over there. I really think that we have to understand the role of wealth, not just as economic power that corrupts the system, but that wealth has always been there from the beginning, wealth and property. It was there in the logical design of the Constitution from the very get-go. You know, I uh, and when I was in when I was in high school, I used to dream about becoming a U.S. senator. And um, I later worked in the state legislature in Texas as an undergraduate. I was an aide to two members of the House. I had been invited to stay on with one of them when he runs for Congress. Um, in fact, he's still in Congress. He's the most right-wing member of Congress, and I turned him down, Henry Cisneros. And so I had an opportunity to go and work in D.C. inside, and from a young age, I saw it up close. And, you know, nothing really stood out for me more than this one time when uh, a lobbyist took Representative Cisneros and I, and, you know, I've, I've been trying to tell people running against him about these stories and they just don't really want to hear them <laughs> for some reason. Mm. And we were taken out to lunch by an energy industry lobbyist. I can't remember who he represented anymore. It was decades ago. And I sat there thinking, oh, there's something wrong with this. This guy is here like every week in the office. There's something wrong with all of this. And later, you know, I realized that, you know, my dream of becoming a U.S. senator was out of reach because I would need a lot of money. And since I didn't have money, I came from a working class family who didn't go to college. My parents didn't go to college. And my father was an immigrant and uh, came to the country without documentation. I realized later on that because I couldn't afford to uh, run for office, that I would teach about political science instead. So it's it's very fundamental to my own personal background, experience, and identity. In our first episode, the season with Christian Fritz, who's written a fabulous book, American Sovereigns. You know, we we talk about how we disposed of our king. You know, back in 1776, and then shortly after, ten years later or so, in 1787, 88. The framers were beginning to take sort of a very sharp departure from this idea that the people would govern themselves. It was a ubiquitous idea. People everywhere in this country were attracted to and supported the idea that the people would govern themselves. But when the framers met behind closed doors in Philadelphia, they had a different sense of how the democracy would work, even though they themselves also seemed to support that idea. But in practice, it was a different, it was a different kind of political system that they wanted to set up, one that pretty much excluded the mass of people from making decisions. So you end up having a system run by a small, powerful elite, as Michael Claren puts it, a coup. Yes, I I would actually argue that I agree with Klarman. I, I think he's his analysis is spot on. And when I really first started doing research for this book about four years ago, I I was really mesmerized by Klarman's book. I thought, wow, here is a major law school professor who is describing the Constitutional Convention as a coup. And I've seen very little negative reaction to that. And, and I think Klarman's research is just incredibly detailed and very inspiring to me. And it was reading his book that I realized I really need to go back and really look at all the letters and the diaries and the you know, fragmented transcripts there are of the convention and the state ratifying conventions and the pamphlets and the unpublished notes. And what I saw was not so much the focus on whether the framers believed in the sovereignty of the individual 
or the sovereignty of the states for that matter. But I saw it as the sovereignty of property. And I think that Clarman's book is just an extraordinary book. But like most others who are writing about the Constitution, even from a critical perspective, uh, they've missed this. And except for perhaps Robert Dahl, who late in life really got it. And in some ways, his last message to his readers was that I got it wrong all these years. You know, when I argued that pluralist coalitions can come together and tip the balance of power and that class doesn't matter. And suddenly he comes out with this book mm. where he, he makes a point in passing that, you know, it is the property of elites that the system benefits. Although he doesn't really go into so much detail other than the obvious, you know, the electoral college and so forth to, and the three-fifths compromise to make this argument. Now, I, I actually also think that there's kind of a mistake in thinking that the framers changed their minds at some point. There's a lot of evidence that most of the framers, what most people call the founding fathers, most of those framers were actually hesitant or outright opposed to the revolution. And it was no secret that some of them were already anti-democratic. They preferred Rome over Athens. And I, I want to share with you a passage from John Adams' famous book that some of the framers had read. And Adams was not a framer because he was off in Europe as an ambassador with Jefferson. And Adams' book had, had really circulated in he described democracy as waste, exhausts, and murders itself. And he even felt, quote unquote, terror when he thought of elections, which were, quote unquote, productive of horrors. This is not a hidden secret. They're saying this out in the open. And so when the framers start the Constitution with we the people, they end it with requiring ratification not by a direct popular vote. In fact, we've never gotten to vote on any part of the Constitution. There's never been a vote. There's not allowed uh, in, the, in Article 5. But in the last article, it requires state ratifying conventions, and it requires only a supermajority of nine to ratify the Constitution, not, of, not by the states, not consensus of the states, which is what the Articles of Confederation required, consensus of the states in the Congress and a consensus in state uh, votes. So when Clarman says this was a constitutional coup, he's essentially saying they changed the rules. Yeah. They were sent to Philadelphia to fix the articles, but they changed yeah. the rules and then replaced it. Right. Mm -hmm. And I would also, one last thing about this is that I would also say that there is, there's no real embrace of sovereignty of the individual or the people, because there's virtually no rights for people in the articles. And that's one of the reasons why the anti-federalists were, were gaining momentum during the ratification process, is people are looking at it and going, well, I thought we fought for consent of the governed. There's no right to vote. I thought we fought for rights. There's no rights. I thought we fought to be able to change our system of government. That's not in there. Mm -hmm. Uh, where the people, there's virtually no rights in the articles, unless you count habeas corpus or the right to a jury trial for a criminal case. Just to be clear, when you say the articles, you're talking about the articles in our Constitution, not the Articles of Confederation. That's correct. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So regarding the articles in our Constitution, the Constitution starts with the preamble, and you mentioned the founders and the framers, which, which I've always found a little curious as well, because you, you have people like Thomas Paine, who many consider to be the founding father of the United States, really, because he, more than any one person, galvanized Americans to dispose of the king. Common Sense was the book that ignited a revolution and, and caused the United States to fight for its independence. He gets discarded almost immediately. He's the one that's, you know, talking about the people can govern themselves. We don't need a king. We don't need to be subjugated by an outside force. We can do this ourselves. 
who would you put in the group of actual founders for this country? Hmm. And do you see a distinction between the framers and the founders? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting point. I am focused only on the people that actually wrote the Constitution mm -hmm. and advocated on its behalf for ratification, okay. and then also those who are opposed to ratification or critical of the Constitution, the mm -hmm. Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, essentially. I really, I, I really think that part of the issue that we have when we think about Thomas Paine as one of the founders is that Paine is a complex person. A lot of people don't realize the complexity of it. Even, even my friend Peter Leinbaugh, who just I've admired for decades since as a young student, I met him. And, you know, I, I think he's an incredible historian, but his book on Thomas Paine misses an important aspect of Thomas Paine. But Thomas Paine, nonetheless, is, he's an intellectual force, of course, to motivate people to join the struggle. Mm. However, the important thing to remember is that all those unnamed people, and even the named ones that we know about who weren't elites, who were involved in the revolution, um, including women and slaves that fought on the side of, of the revolutionaries, they didn't win in the end. As Peter Landau points out, there was a conservative outcome to a revolutionary situation. The framers that are most important are the ones that wrote the rules of the system, or I should say rewrote the rules of the system, because those who fought the revolution then took their politics of the street and of the struggle into the state and got into the state legislatures and started to democratize them. And we can talk about that more later, but they expanded the right to vote by lowering property requirements. They engage in some forms of economic democracy, like price controls and creating land banks and so forth. Those folks lost. So they're not actually the framers because the system they were busy setting up was essentially derailed in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787. The winners write the history. Exactly. You mentioned the uh, anti-federalists, and that would be a, 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 an interesting thing to talk about as well. They had arguments for not ratifying the Constitution that were very substantial arguments, not to mention the fact that the Constitution itself and these ratifying conventions was passed in, in many cases by a very, very slim majority. Mm -hmm. There was a real tension between the people who were expressly looking for a more democratic system versus the ones who were trying to limit it, the ones who actually won the debate in the end. Yeah, I think that's an that's a very important point. And one of the things that we overlook today is that for all the problems in our system, and I that's what my book does is outline the undemocratic aspects of the Constitution designed to protect property against economic democracy. That for all of that, what little does exist that expands rights to individuals, that creates a negative right to vote, et cetera, is the result of the very first mass movement of the constitutional era, and that is of the anti-federalists, led by small farmers and small merchants and laborers, that skilled laborers that we call mechanics, uh, some of whom split and said the Constitution actually takes us backwards. And in the ratifying conventions and in the anti-federalist papers, which tragically are not available in their entirety online, unlike the federalist papers, it's not available even in print anymore. Really? Only as an ebook by the University of Chicago, hmm. which I think is a, an example of uh, academic censorship in my discipline, but uh -huh. another story. But the anti-federalist critique of the Constitution is really the first struggle to democratize the Constitution. The outcome, of course, are the 12 amendments that Madison collates from all the ideas for changing the Constitution before it's ratified. And they cut this deal at some of the state conventions to buy out votes and convince people to vote to ratify. 
with the promise that we're going to go off and amend it. So the fact that we have the Bill of Rights, it's pretty well known, is in response to the struggle of the anti-federals. Although we also misunderstand the Bill of Rights. We think, oh, the Bill of Rights are all about rights for people. Well, there are also rights for property. If you look at the Fourth and the Fifth and the Seventh Amendments, they are also about rights for property. And then the Tenth, which is not about people, it's about the powers of the states. So the Bill of Rights, there's a lot of mythology built up around it. And the mythology obscures the fact that it's a compromise that was a result of a struggle that almost killed the ratification of the Constitution. After the quick ratification of four states, the Anti-Federalists won a few uh, no votes. And then the Constitution was looking like it was going to sink. And so the Anti-Federalists play an incredibly important role in forcing changes to the Constitution. Unfortunately, today, the Anti-Federalists are being appropriated by the far right, the white nationalists in some ways, which I think is kind of tragic and a mistake. And it speaks to our lack of understanding as a country of our actual history and, and our form of government. Yeah, you know, it's ironic that, you know, if you go back to the so-called Tea Party of the Obama era, uh, the people that were protesting, you know, don't touch my constitution, essentially, were almost overwhelmingly working class people. Mm -hmm. They were retirees who were on Medicare. Yeah. Who were claiming that Obama was trying to take away their, what they didn't realize was state funded health care. Mm -hmm. And so what underlies the emergence of the far right is increasingly a strong appeal to primarily the white working class who think that their constitution is somehow being sabotaged for whatever imagined reason. But the irony of that is that it's not their constitution, and it was designed actually to be uh, a rule system that benefits and protects the acquisition and protection of property, which is what Madison is explicit about in Federalist Number 10. Yeah, I think what they, I'm not sure, but I, I would say they see the constitution as protecting the supremacy of the individual rather than of property, right? And that their individual rights trump everything else in the world, even if the government wants to come in and do something nice for them, to hell with that. I have my individual rights to refuse that, and I'm going to stick by my guns, you know, and because my individual rights are what the Constitution is all about. You know, it's like that argument about the, the sovereignty of the states versus the federal government, you know, what where's the dividing line there? It is a little confusing when I think of that. That came up in the last episode with Christian Fritz about the idea that Madison split the atom and created divided sovereignty between the, the states and, and the federal government. Jerry Frazier describes the Constitution as more of an economic document. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with Jerry about that. And, you know, tragically, his book is long out of print because that publisher went out of business mm -hmm. uh, a while back, uh, South End Press. Um, but I agree with Jerry that the Constitution is more of a, 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 a rule system for the political economy of capitalism than it is about granting sovereignty individ to individuals or consent to the governed or rights for people. Madison is pretty explicit about that, along with Hamilton and the many Federalist papers that they authored. John Jay wrote a few of them as well. Madison, it's no accident that Madison is referred to as the Karl Marx of the capitalist class, because in his Federalist Papers particularly, and the most famous being Federalist 10, but I, I think there's a number of others that make this kind of analysis, that Madison points out that we need this system, a system that we describe as organized around checks and balances and Federalist sharing of power between the federal government and the states, because that would be the best protection for property. And uh, particularly, I just want to share a passage from Federalist 10, uh, where Madison writes that such democracies, and here he's referring to republics, 
in the past, like the Dutch Republic and others throughout history, because he did this extensive analysis of confederations and republics in history and why they failed. Such democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention, have ever been found incompatible with personal security or the rights of property, and have in general been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. And so for Madison, he's making an argument that this constitution is not what you think it is. It's really about designing uh, a system where the elite property owners will have the ability to block anything that is being considered in the system as if they're opposed to it. And that's why I referred to, rather than thinking of checks and balances as a protection against abuse of power, like a monarch or a king, and it does that. But I also encourage folks to think about checks and balances as being a minority check, mm -hmm. a check of those who are opposed to change to be able to block that change from happening. You say lacking trust in democracy, Madison, Hamilton, Washington, and the other framers designed the system so that change could only occur if it was supported by the minority of the elites who control government and own the economy. There you go. I mean, there's substantial amount of evidence that points to this conclusion, isn't there? Absolutely. Um, you know, Madison really kind of builds this structure. And I, and I keep focusing on Madison because Madison was in some ways the, he was the facilitator of the convention. He really helped it actually happen. Uh, Hamilton had long proposed back in the late 1770s, designing new economic powers for the Congress and having meetings, but it was really Madison that made it happen and then kept them on track uh, to design a kind of consensus document. Uh, but Madison explains in Federalist Number 47, and just to be clear, the Federalist Papers were those editorials that primarily he and Hamilton wrote to make an argument mm -hmm. for why the state should ratify the Constitution. In 47, he writes that the Constitution would avoid the tyranny, quote unquote, of one, a few, or many. And so here he's pretty explicit that, you know, I am i don't really trust my fellow elites. And, you know, Washington echoes this famously in his retirement speech, his farewell speech. Mm. Uh, but Madison here is saying, I don't really trust my fellow elites. You know, people will try to use a system where power is not separated across the three branches and shared between with the states because it could lead to a new dictatorship or of the few uh, he's worried about uh, what he calls factions which we could also understand as meaning parties or interest groups or even classes today um, or the many so he wants to have a system where power is divided so it'd be hard for not just avoiding a dictator or a king, but also avoiding democracy. Because democracies for him and for other framers, and there's a lot of evidence that there was a widespread agreement about this, democracies were seen as a threat to property. That ordinary people with little or no property, if their hands were on the levers of power, they would be a threat to their property. And remember also at that time, a lot of people had small amounts of property land wasn't really worth very much, but there were really a very, very small number of people who had tremendous amounts of property. It was not an egalitarian society in terms of property ownership by any means, and the tax records show that. A great example would be James Wilson, right? He became a land speculator. At one point, he had over a million acres. He went to prison because he defaulted on his loans. Yeah eventually went to live with his son, I think in Carolina or something like that. Maybe he developed dementia. I'm not quite sure. Nonetheless, he was basically discarded also by the framers in their writings. He sort of discredited the elites in some level. He and along with Robert Morris, Wilson, who later becomes justice, 
yep. short period of time, he and Robert Morris enriched themselves during the intervening period. Yeah. Starting during the revolution, but especially during the intervening period. Um, he's very close business associate of Robert Morris and Governor Morris. They're not related. Uh, they are the owners of the bank, one of the first banks in Pennsylvania. Uh, mm. They have they have ownership in these land speculating companies mm. that are competing with each other for those Western lands you were referring to. Yeah, which they needed the Constitution actually to resolve. You know, in Article One, Congress has given the authority to deal with all lands because they couldn't come to an agreement. And that's what held up the ratification of the Articles of Confederation is these land companies were pitting the states against each other. And remember where these lands came from. They came from genocidal attacks on Native Americans to exterminate them and move them off their lands. But Wilson, you're absolutely right. Um, and the Morrises are part of one faction, along with Franklin, who have vast lands Ben Franklin was also a big land speculator. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, so there's different factions of property owners at the Constitutional Convention, and they're all really kind of in competition when they arrive. You know, maybe a third of them are slave owners or profit directly from slavery. Um, some of them are big creditors who need to get repaid. Right. Yeah. There's the landowners. There's the merchants and traders. And they all have competing interests. George Washington is, a, I think, the largest landholder at the time, maybe yes. worth an enormous amount of money. Yes. I want to get back to Madison, though, because he came from Virginia, and he went to the convention with his Virginia plan. And I understand that if that plan had been ratified, we would have a significantly different form of government today. His greatest disappointment, I believe, was the compromise that he made over the Senate. Is that right? I think one of his big defeats at the convention is that he wanted to have what he called a negative over the states. And he wanted to have the Congress be able to directly overturn any decision made by the states. He wanted to also have uh, longer terms in the Senate. Um, but I think he ended up in the end getting something that may not have looked the way that he originally intended it to look, but it certainly served the functions that he was attempting to achieve. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he he could live with the way the Senate was apportioned. That was okay in his mind because he needed the Constitution to be ratified. And again, and I've said it many times, I can sympathize to a degree with their motivations because... I mean, I, I can only imagine, I mean, you're, you're starting off a new country, you're breaking away from Britain, you know, a king, a very powerful country. Um, you have Native American insurrections, no excuse for the genocide that followed, but you have slave insurrections, no excuse. Obviously, the slaves were justified in having an insurrection, you know, but they had a lot of liabilities on their hand if they were going to keep the country functioning. But they they never really grappled with the idea that somehow everybody could have a say in the way the government would function, have a say in the national goals or aspirations. There was There was no discussion about that. The United States was going to be powerful, strong military force in the world that protected property. Yes. Uh, I think that ultimately the design of the Constitution results in a kind of system that's very different from what had been common among the states. And I I tend to think that the Articles of Confederation actually did create a kind of country. And we tend to completely whitewash out, literally and figuratively, that previous history. The Articles of Confederation, which took a number of years to get ratified because of this dispute over those Western lands, created a very decentralized system. Hamilton and Madison both dismissed it as a kind of league and not 
an actual system, like a voluntary league. But the articles were a form of constitution. They left most of the power with the states because there were no implied powers. And so the states had a lot of innovations at that time that gets wiped away in the constitution. For example, some of them were unicameral. They had one house. Mm -hmm. Many of them did not have a, a veto. Uh, one state didn't even have a governor. It had an executive council, Pennsylvania. There was a state that was never accepted as a state, Vermont, that had abolished slavery, the 14th state, if you will, that wasn't actually part of it. There was no judicial review. The state courts could not overturn laws of the legislature, and there were very short terms for the lower house if there were two houses and lower property requirements. So these states really experimented with a lot of things that scared a lot of the framers. And so I tend to think that the Virginia plan, the New Jersey plan, and Hamilton's plan, we forget about Hamilton's plan, which he presented in an right. extraordinary eight-hour speech, apparently, <laughs> uh, which was almost all entirely rejected. Ultimately, whatever the differences are between those plans, they in the end, they get a system that builds a consensus among the elites of the different states. Now, remember, when the convention begins, these elites all differ in their interests. They think their best future lies in being the elites of their state. By the end of it, a few months later, Madison and Hamilton and, and Jay and, um, uh, and Washington are able to cobble together a new class unity if you will, between all those different competing property interests mm. to realize that they are best served by having a national system of government. Because mm. that's essentially what our federal government is. They use the euphemism federalism and they distort its meaning. Mm -hmm. But ultimately having a national government is the best protection for their property rather than the states because they were losing control in some of the states. Right. It should have been called the Nationalist Papers, not the Federalist Papers, right? That's, that's <laughs> one kind of uh, uh, smoke and mirror trick that they use to, right. to to not frighten people about having it. Because the, these states were giving up their sovereignty to the, to the national government. That's what was going on. They were saying, OK, look, we're all in this together. That's right. We're all going right. to follow the same rules. And you're right that the states had sovereignty. Those were free and independent states, as the Declaration of Independence calls it in the last paragraph several times. Mm -hmm. They negotiated their own treaties. They had their own money. They made their own laws. There was no way to appeal or overrule any of their, their laws. This seems to me to be the source of the argument today. States' rights, but they all exist or coexist under the federal umbrella of our national government. That's right. Our, our rights are mediated by the government itself, which is a built-in contradiction. Right. We have a Supreme Court now, and we've had it for a long time. And, you know, for, for better or worse, you know, it's, it's set up again to serve the interests of the elites. I would argue it. You have a chapter on that. Uh, Servants above its masters, I think it's called. Right. In our last episode with Christian, we talked about how we disposed the king, and then there was immediately thereafter this sort of conversation that emerges about who is the sovereign, and how do they express themselves, and when, and you know how can they govern themselves? What are the actual, as you say, levers? You mentioned Carl Becker. Carl Becker called the two questions of the revolution. Okay, the first was the question of home rule. The second was the question of who should rule at home. So I think it's the same idea there, right? Becker puts it very well. And in some ways, it's echoed uh, later by Peter Limebaugh, the idea that uh, the struggle of the, the Revolutionary War for Independence is really a struggle about the transition to capitalism, as I see it, that the colonies are being exploited for their resources and their labor by the British Empire. And so this struggle for independence is really at the same time a parallel struggle for who would govern this new economic system that would be developed. 
And for a few years, I think there was a real possibility for this country to go in a different direction. The three insurrections that I talk about in the book, by slaves, by Native Americans resisting settler colonialism, and then by the small subsistence farmers who are outside or on the margins of the cash economy, really have a different kind of system in mind, if you will. And to some degree, what we've been talking about at the state level, we start to see a little bit elements of that, what today we would call social democracy, of using government as a way to level out the inequalities of society. And this is all thrown to the side, essentially, when the Constitution um, is written and then ratified. It consolidates control over this new type of economy a national capitalist economy uh, that would be backed by government as uh, the uh, surety for credit, for currency, protecting property, both from domestic threats and external threats, uh, and then also being able to have the resources to project power into other parts of the Atlantic hemisphere and across the continent by to fund military power. Mm -hmm. So Becker's point is a really important one, because, but it's not really consolidated until the Constitution is ratified. Right. That's when we really see that transition from um, who would control politically to also who would control economically. I'm not sure who Carl Becker is. I haven't looked him up yet. He was a historian um, who wrote about uh, this kind of struggle for control uh, from the colonial period to the constitutional period, particularly in the state of New York. You're touching on the idea of the determinists and the regulators. And you, you say in your book, Massachusetts taxes, for example, were four to five times higher by 1786. And so you mentioned the Shays regulator rebellion what did you mean by regulator rebellion? I never heard it put that way. The regulators were a movement at the at, for the previous few decades. And the people at the time actually called themselves regulators. So when the Shays Rebellion is referred to as a, reg, as a movement of the regulators, it's something that goes back several decades uh, to the 1760s. Uh, when in North Carolina, uh, there had been uh, movements of small farmers and laborers who challenged uh, the uh, colonial legislature and the property elites around different economic policies. And so they literally called themselves regulators because they believed that they had say over what uh, the colonial governments were doing and later the state governments, and that they could literally regulate what policymakers were doing. That clears it up for me. I did not quite grasp that until just now. And then the, the determinists were pretty much of the same ilk. They thought that they could determine for themselves what form of government they wanted and where they wanted it. They created states, Vermont and Kentucky. I think there was a state proposed called Franklin. Right. These guys were all about self-government, we, the people, determine how we're going to live and how we're going to set up our government and, and who is going to be represented and in what way. But that battle was, was fairly well lost, I would say, by certainly by the time of the Civil War. Well, the regulators were different than the people that tried to set up states like Franklin. Uh, some of those proposed states like Franklin were actually really just fronts for these large land companies. Uh, they, they wanted to short circuit this conflict we were talking about earlier by just setting up a state and then claiming that that land was within that state's boundaries. Was was Franklin set up by Ben Franklin? Is that his state? No, no. <laughs> oh, okay. No, but there were several other proposals like that. There was uh, another proposed state uh, called Westavania. Yeah. Um, where they this was a this was kind of a an attempt to to settle. Uh, who controlled these lands that no one was able to settle, essentially. Right. Yeah, yeah. There's something really fascinating about the Shays Rebels. 
Um, and I, the, to kind of get back to your question, you know, I, I refer to them as regulators uh, because there's a little too much attention put on Captain Shays as the leader. He was one of three people who really sparked it, um, but he's the one we remember the most. And essentially they had um, come back from the revolution. These were rank and file soldiers and low level officers like Shays to find that uh, Massachusetts was imposing these onerous taxes uh, in order to generate cold, hard cash, silver and gold that they could use to pay back the creditors who now owned a lot of the outstanding hundreds of millions of dollars of revolutionary war debt that Congress and, and most of the states could not repay. And so these additional taxes were actually being imposed by a conservative controlled state legislature um, that was influenced by the creditors. And so these farmers went home and uh, put on their uniforms, picked up their muskets and marched on these courthouses that were attempting to foreclose on their farms to force them to pay those taxes. So the Shays Regulated Rebellion was really a struggle against the very objectives of having a system of government that served the property of elites and is really the one of the main motivating factors for why more people showed up in Philadelphia when the convention was called than had shown up to the Annapolis convention, which was really kind of a flop. They couldn't even really meet. And so they called for another meeting and then got Congress after a long struggle, got Congress to finally approve the Philadelphia convention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But those two conventions were only the last two steps of an effort that had been going on for years to map out a new kind of economic system. Uh, there had been previous meetings, including at Washington's slave plantation, uh, to develop a kind of cross-state economic uh, agreement, particularly around tariffs and other kinds of taxes on imports between the states. All of this stuff boils down to really one thing, and that is who's going to be represented and, and how are they going to be represented? I guess you could say two things. Who's going to be represented and how are they going to be represented? That was a, a major part of the discussion going on during the convention, before the convention, and after right up until the Civil War when the South lost its advantage in the Senate because a number of free states were formed suddenly the South lost its power in the Senate, and the only way they could protect themselves was to basically fight a war. Well, I think, you know, the, it, it all begins with the first three words, we the people. Mm -hmm. I think understanding the objectives of the framers and designing the Constitution is everything is said in those first three words, but not for the reasons that we learn from elementary school. You know, I asked my students when we study the preamble, um, you know, if you ever watch Schoolhouse Rock, Schoolhouse Rock is something I grew up with. And, um, you know, in, uh, in the ones about government, they portray the people as we look today, diverse, racially, gender, sex, mm -hmm. ability. But that's not the way that the framers thought of we the people. They thought of we the people as being essentially white men with significant amounts of property. Those are the ones that would have the rights and the privileges and the power under the Constitution. And essentially, we the people were people like us, which was a very small slice of the population. And ultimately, what comes out in the Constitution is a system that um, in the first few presidential elections, there's only really a few thousand people who are eligible to vote because they meet the property requirements of the states. And Article I essentially grants the states to make rules about who can vote. The, the ratification conventions are, in some states, the delegates are elected. In some states, they're essentially appointed by the state legislatures. But I mean in the presidential elections. Okay. There's really a very small number of people who can actually vote. Right. And... Um, but there have been studies that have been done of uh, where people were able to vote on the delegates to the ratification conventions. Um, there's a really startling um, outcome about, you know, there's really good analysis by one historian of uh, which of those people were elites, which were, you know, middle income, which were farmers and so forth, and uh, which kind of delegates that they prefer. 
And uh, they actually, in some states, uh, the majority voted for what became anti-federalist delegates. But kind of getting back to uh, we the people, because you were asking about the preamble earlier. And, Mm -hmm. you know, the preamble, I think, is both more important and less important than we make it out to be. And that might seem like a a kind of Hegelian, um, (laughs) you know, (laughs) dichotomy. But um, we overlook the preamble in many ways, although most Americans really are only familiar with the preamble uh, because it has this philosophical language. The rest of the Constitution is very nuts and bolts and kind of technical and and obtuse, right? It's very difficult to really understand and follow. It's written in late 18th century English, but the preamble has these flowing concepts. And so when I ask my students you know what? You know what do you think of about our system of government? Um, you know what makes the Constitution different from the Declaration of Independence? It's incredible how many students will say, "Well, the Constitution is what gives us our rights." And the reality is that there's almost no rights for people in the Articles, and that comes later, as we talked about, starting with the Bill of Rights. And uh, but I, I devote a whole chapter to the preamble because. You know, uh, Sanford Levinson, who has written several incredible uh, critical books about the Constitution, uh, points out um, also that court cases also uh, judges tend to ignore uh, the preamble. And uh, I think that the the preamble in some ways tells us everything that we really need to know about the intention of the framers. And it wasn't what we think, that it that it creates a system of government to be run by uh, the vast majority of the population. For example, ensuring domestic tranquility. I interpret each clause. So the entire chapter on the preamble is I go through each clause and interpret it. But uh, ensuring domestic tranquility, to me, is really about creating a national government that would have the resources uh, to protect property. And what are those resources? Uh, being able to create a system of taxation uh, that would help pay off the creditors, uh, so it would settle the 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 reality that the that the country at this point was a, a bad credit risk, and that would create economic tranquility. And then once it creates a publicly backed financial system with stable currency um, and tax revenue, then it could start to fund the expansion of a military that would put down slave rebellions and carry out the settler colonial project, and then also suppress rebellions like the Shays Rebellion. Uh, So domestic tranquility is not about having a peaceful society where all our needs are met and we all get along. It's about tranquility for those who have the vast amount of property. It's about putting down rebellions and control. Yes, I I think that the preamble in some way speaks to, Mm. in a very vague way, Mm. the objectives of the framers. I think everything we need to know about the rest of the Constitution in some ways is embedded in this very, very short paragraph. And um, it's something that uh, we think we know and understand, but no one's really ever delved into it and and really broken it down and, and looked at what do these clauses all mean? It's 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 super interesting. I do want to say though that we we've, we've hit on this topic many times throughout this podcast, this discussion, the fear of leveling, the wealthy being controlled by the masses, their power being dissolved, you know, somehow by the mass of people in the United States. There was some logic to it all because they needed a form of stability, right? But it was it was not necessarily a democratic form of stability. Let's put it that way, perhaps. I went to hear a lecture by Russ Feingold recently and down at Stanford Law School, and I met the uh, director of the Constitutional Law Center there at Stanford. His name is Michael McConnell. And he, you know, he was a a Bush appointee and appellate judge and, and all that. Uh, and I, you know, I asked him if, I, I asked him why wasn't there a robust discussion going on about how we could strengthen or or fortify our democracy, make it, making it more democratic. And, uh, you know, I was standing there in a small group of people in the courtyard, and, and he just 
basically came back and said, oh, God forbid, we don't, we don't want to have more democracy in this country. That'd be like the worst thing that could happen. You know, that, God, no way, you know, that'd be terrible. And, and it was like, oh, there it is right there. Even today, we have people who are afraid of democracy. They're, they, they, they don't want it. Not their goal. And he's the director of the Constitutional Law Center at Stanford. Yeah, it's uh, it's both an honest admission, but it's also a disturbing revelation to understand that those who lie on what we call the conservative side of the political spectrum in this country are now coming out in recent years, and he's not alone. Senator Lee of Utah has said this explicitly. Um, you hear this uh, now increasingly in the more conservative media that we're not a democracy, we're a republic. And I think that's an honest admission, and it's long overdue in some ways to understand that by saying that we're a republic means that we have, a, we have representatives, but we don't have a direct vote. The people do not have the ability to make decisions directly. Uh, we don't even have the right to vote on uh, who will serve in two of the three branches of our federal government. Mm -hmm. We don't vote directly for the president and the vice president because of the Electoral College. They nominate federal judges who are confirmed by the Senate. And originally, we only voted for members of the House. We didn't get to vote for the Senate until a little over a century ago when we amend the Constitution. So what a lot of people don't really fully understand is, uh, you know, is shrouded by that, that cloud of mythology that we have a system uh, that empowers the majority to democratically make decisions and that decisions are only made by the will of the majority. And when we understand that our system actually works to put up roadblocks and impediments in the way of the majority, whenever uh, the property minority oppose that change, then we can better understand that we don't have a democratic system. And so I'm not surprised that uh, Professor Connell um, would say this, um, because there's the understanding that we have a republic, not a democracy, and any attempt to try to expand and democratize our system, which began almost immediately, as we talked about, um, has been seen as creating what Madison Federalist 10 calls spectacles of turbulence, that we blame the, we hear blame cast on the everyday people for being uh, tumultuous and unpredictable and um, attempting to serve their own interests at the expense of the general will. Mm -hmm. These are themes that Hamilton and Madison and others made points about at the convention and Hamilton and Madison and the Federalist Papers. Um, and so there's this kind of critique of democracy that when we have too many people who are really incapable of making decisions that um, serve their interests, they're also creating instability in the system. And, and you know, we see this today in many different ways, for example, in, in voter suppression. Um, or President Trump's unsubstantiated lies about how the election was stolen from him by primarily uh, poll workers who are people of color, right? There's this underlying racism that goes, harkens back even to the period of Reconstruction when these myths and lies were made about uh, newly enfranchised Black voters getting elected to office and then supposedly pillaging their states um, through corruption and bribery, which were just unsubstantiated. Today, we're hearing just a modern version of that, that democracy means everyday people um, with their hands on political power is just a corrupting force. These are people who don't believe in democracy, essentially. Right. The suppression of democratic values and principles is, is what we're seeing the vast majority of Americans agree on all the major issues. Legal abortion, 62%. Climate crisis, 75%. Minimum wage, 62%. Paid family leave, 70%. Legal marijuana, 91%. Unions, 
71%. Medicare for all, 69%. Equal rights amendment for women, 78%. Mass incarceration, tax the rich, 80%. Free college, 58%. Free, free pre-K, 71%. Stopping voter suppression, LGBTQ and rights, 71%. Take money out of politics, more gun control, 70%. And it goes on. Yet, very little is being done that reflects the majority will of the people, largely because of the system we have. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad that you included all those poll results. And while polls don't uh, officially represent the interests of the majorities in our system, the disconnect between the clear majority preferences in these polls with all their limits to polling and, and what actually happens is an illustration of the way that our system is dysfunctional, not because of contemporary issues like dark money and lack of you know voter interest, mm. but because the system was designed to block and impede any attempts at political democracy and prevent attempts at economic democracy. And many of those things you list uh, are a combination of both, you know, LGBT rights, for example, uh, controlling the police. Those are forms of political democracy. Uh, minimum wage and making it easier to form unions, those are forms of economic democracy. And you know, we can look at the history of this country for over 230 years since the Constitution went into effect, and we can see over and over again that uh, throughout our country's history, majorities have not gotten what they wanted unless it corresponded with the interests of the, of the minority property elites. The periods when we've gotten the greatest reform, for example, with white male suffrage in the early 1800s, the Reconstruction era after the Civil War or the populist reforms of the late 1800s, um, World War I, uh, with, uh, with workers uh, being able to uh, be recognized as being able to form unions. And then during the New Deal and the environmental laws of the 60s and 70s, those came about because there was an unavoidable, disruptive mass movement of people that just could not be avoided and they couldn't be co-opted they couldn't be suppressed and let's also the civil rights movement um in response these reforms were implemented and so they were able to overcome these minority checks now the reality is that in the end those reforms didn't exactly look like everything people wanted and over time they were killed by the death by a thousand cuts phenomenon but the reality is that until we have a mass mobilization of a significant, even minority of the population, we won't get these changes because every time the most reasonable, well thought out changes are introduced into our system, because of the minority checks, those reforms have to consent to being changed every time they face a, a possible roadblock and impediment in order to get those who are opposed to the majority wanted change, the majority, majority desired change, to set aside their opposition and they can change that bill or that regulation in order to get it approved. And I'll just give you a very brief example of this because this summer, uh, a lot of people were celebrating the Inflation Reduction Act for having tens of billions of dollars in there for green tech. But that's the third incarnation of what used to be called the Green New Deal, which started off as hard and fast restrictions on the emissions of fossil fuels, uh, a massive jobs program to train people into helping rewire our fossil fuel-driven economic system, and lots of other really good things. That never got a vote in the Senate. What comes up next when Biden becomes president a few years later Biden puts forward the Build Back Better plan. It doesn't have any hard and fast caps on fossil fuel emissions, but it has other things that you listed in those poll results. That was blocked in the Senate by two senators, Democrats both, because they were backed by the fossil fuel industry and the big banks. And what we get out of that is a, a tiny sliver of 
what the Build Back Better bill was at a, a, about a fifth of the price tag and does almost nothing. And in fact, now subsidizes the biggest polluters to get them to voluntarily shift over to so-called green tech. And that, that's the Inflation Reduction Act you're talking about. That's right. And so, and I write about this in a piece for uh, yeah. for the chief uh, labor magazine and dollars and cents as well, um, that the Inflation Reduction Act is a great example of the way that the majority's will is over and over blocked or watered down or co-opted or distorted in the process that we call the sausage making process. There you go. This is not an accident. This is the way that the framers designed the system, embedding minority checks throughout the system to ensure that anything that that goes into law or becomes a new regulation uh, serves the interests of the property elites. I call the Constitution uh, a love letter from the elites of the 18th century to the elites of today. There you go. Yeah, and some people say that's a brilliant system. I'm beginning to realize that it's becoming a very dangerous one, and I hope that we can change it before our lives are over it's it's up to the living you know that it's my view and many people will disagree with me that we need we they'll say we don't need a new constitution or a, a more democratic political system i don't know how you can argue that it's a good thing to have a political system that is basically ineffective in providing the policies that the majority of americans want that, that to me is just something that we shouldn't be putting up with so look your book is brilliant I, i'm really glad we had a chance to meet and to talk about it media elites by robert Ulbricht. he, he uh he did an outstanding job at finding the historical information that supports the argument that these guys were not really thinking about the everyday average american they were thinking about the folks who ran the show the folks who had the power and the resources to create another empire, basically, one called the United States. Well, thank you, John. It's It's been great being in conversation with you about uh, the Constitution. And I, I think it's really crucial that to understand our undemocratic Constitution, we have to understand our capitalist Constitution. And um, I look forward to hearing more from folks who are able to read my book. Thank you very much, Robert. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. If you ask Robert Ovitz, he'll tell you the elites have been served and protected by our Constitution right from the get-go. He makes a compelling case. The framers' intentions were not to create a democracy. Rather, they designed a system of government that would protect their property. I'd love to know what you think. Please leave your comments on our new YouTube channel. Just search for The Peaceful Political Revolution in America on YouTube. And thanks in advance for adding your voice to the discussion. It's pretty clear the term the United States of America was first used in the Articles of Confederation. Our first constitution was written by none other than Ben Franklin, Silas Steen, and John Dickinson, as well as the committee which finalized its content. It was agreed upon by the Congress assembled on November 15th in 1777. However, it was not ratified until March 1st of 1781. Perhaps this is why so many Americans forget about our first constitution and why there is some confusion over who the founders and framers actually were. Do we the people want a constitution that prioritizes property over democracy? Was the convention a coup? Do we have at its core a political system designed of, by, and for the elites? A national dialogue is emerging. Americans want to know why their system of government has suddenly become so dysfunctional. Gary Burton is on deck for a closer look at Thomas Paine and the man he says began it all. What was Paine's message and are his ideas still relevant? Tune in next time for a discussion about our most fundamental democratic right and the radical American who turned us all into revolutionaries. Until then, stay safe out there.